Independence Day. Lots of awe. Uh, who's actually, who's been to Sunday Assembly before? Hey! Lots and lots of people. Who, who hasn't been to Sunday Assembly? Oh, wow. welcome, welcome. Uh, hope you enjoy it. So Sunday Assembly was started back in 2013 as a sort of secular congregation, an alternative to church where people could come and do all the community stuff without necessarily believing any of the uh, God stuff. Now, obviously, 2013, a long time ago, uh, barely any of us were born then. Um, uh, but, believe it or not, there was a time before 2013. The universe was a different place. It was full of mysterious things called Woolworths and, and <laughs> books fizz and bird's eye potato waffles, which are waffly versatile, uh, very much one for the kids there. And yeah, and, and we like to call those fundamental particles, and uh, they're what the universe is, I think, made up of, but maybe our main speaker is is going to correct me on that a little bit, but I think, I think it's more or less right. Um, so yeah, if they were the fundamental particles, there are fundamental questions as well, like, why am I wearing my pyjama top? Uh, why did we have this event on a long bank holiday weekend when, when we knew that everybody was going to be away? We don't know. We don't know. It's, it's not as though we knew the Queen was going to have a jubilee this year, is it? Um, so, yeah, later on we're going to have Harry uh, correcting everything I've just said. Uh, we're also going to have uh, another speaker who's going to be telling us a little bit about their life, somebody from the community. But we're going to start off with, with, um, with a poet. Last time we saw him was when we were doing online Sunday assemblies, and so it's nice to see him in the flesh. This is David Lee Morgan. He's uh, London. UK and BBC Slam Poetry Champion, so he's probably quite good. Um, so with that, I'm just going to hand over to David. Time out for dialectics. We live in a metaphysical world. Physical because even the invisible is material, matter in motion, an infinite ocean of repetition and change. Metaphysical, because we never see it the way it is. We see it the way we make it to be. Which isn't to say it's make-believe, no. It's make-happen. And the happening is how we see. Until it becomes a habit and then it becomes how we don't see. Don't see the new. Don't even see the possibility of the new. But one, divides into two. That's dialectics. For example, out there in video land, you'll have to imagine part of this. Metaphysics says the chair is there. I know it's there because when I sit on it, my bum doesn't hit the floor. Yeah. <laughs> Dialectic says, yes, it is there. On the other hand, <laughs> no, it bloody isn't. <laughs> One divides into two because everything is coming and going. Planets, ideas, emotions, electrons. Always kind of, never kind of, always kind of on the way, never actually here or there. We look out at the world and see objects floating in space. But there is no truly empty space and no absolutely indivisible object. Everything is process, movement, storm. One divides into two, the old and the new, the dying away and the fighting to be born. That's dialectics. Science is a collection of ways of testing what evidence is reliable and what is it? And it's a strategy for stringing that evidence into theories that enable us to make predictions about the world around us and to do things in it. But also, it's a method for demolishing those theories with new evidence 
and building a bigger, bigger, better theory out of the rubble of the old. Science is revolution in the field of knowledge. With science, tradition grows. Tradition is tested. With science, knowledge grows. But is this a good thing? When every new piece of the puzzle seems to come locked up inside its own poison apple, taste me and I will show you how to destroy the world. <laughs> Science is a battleground. We have to fight for the truth. Then we have to fight all over again when they try to use it against us. So those are my first two poems. I'm going to do one more, slightly longer, uh, just a little longer, and, and a lot newer, so I'm going to read it. Uh, I'm a hardcore atheist now. I have been for about 50 years. But I was raised a Catholic. And when I was 14 years old, I went off to the seminary to study to become a Catholic priest. And while I was there, I determined that my life miss mission would be to reconcile scientific determinism with free will. Years later, reading Lenin, writing about Engels, writing about Hegel, I realized that that, that problem had already been solved, or more accurately, had been shown to be a misconception in the way it was framed. So, free will, the metaphysics of the hangman, the original blame game, willpower versus constipation. If you, if you can't make a poop, you're just not trying hard enough. <laughs> But what if all you get are hemorrhoids? The harder you squeeze, the more you bleed. Would you go on squeezing forever? <laughs> or get up off your butt, eat some fiber, drink some water, run around the block a few times, and presto, <laughs> now you can poo. The application of brain power to muscle power, agency. The laws of physics and biochemistry that sewed up your butthole tight as a cork didn't get broken. You just outsmarted them. Why do we do what we do when we know what we know? Why do we do what we do? Because we don't know enough yet. Rationality is not something that can simply be squeezed out. It's buffeted on all sides by fear, desire, loyalty. We need a second level rationality and a third and a fourth where we climb up out of our chemical skin, look at the things we do that seem so rational and begin to map out the influences, the countervailing winds. The more often we do this, the better we can navigate. We can sail off into a never-ending sunset, but no matter, how, no matter how far we get, no matter how free, we are still embedded in a web of causality. True freedom, agency, doesn't break the laws of nature. It outsmarts them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who was expecting poo poems at 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning? You got it. Ah, Phil. Just Phil. Just Phil. Okay, uh, we're coming to our, our main speaker now. He's actually uh, the speaker who's spoken most at Sunday Assembly, more than anybody else, and that's because he's brilliant. And he's got a book. I'm sure he's going to mention it, but just in case. He's got, he's got a book out, and there's an audio book as well. We've, we've, we've just heard from uh, one North American. Whatever you do, don't ask Harry to do his American accent. It's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, enough of this waffle. Here's Harry. Oh, thanks. Um, that's really nice to be here. So I'm um, going to be talking to you about uh, the story in. Oh, hello, is this going to work? I'm going the wrong way. Oh, Other way. Sorry. Up and down. No problem. There we go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the book that I've just written. Well, I say just written, it came out last August. I feel a bit self-conscious coming to a Sunday congregation to try and flog a book, but I suppose, you know, the church has been doing it for 2,000 years. <laughs> um, so, so this book is, is really, it's ultimately about the question that I, my area of research is involved in, and basically also, so I'm a particle physicist, I should say, and yeah, also the, the question that cosmologists ask, which is basically this, which is, what is the world around us made from, and where did it come from? 
And that's the question really that drives a lot of fundamental physics. That's the sort of story that I'm trying to tell in this book. It's actually really two stories. It's the story of the answer to that question, but also how we figured out uh, so much of this story. And there are basically two ways we did this, actually. There's kind of two ways we have as physicists of understanding the world around us. One is by looking up at, at the stars and looking up at the heavens and sort of figuring out what's going on above us. And the other is picking up bits of physical matter from the world around us and doing some pretty unpleasant things to it. So kind of electrocuting it, firing it around in a circle, smashing it into the other bits of stuff. And by, th through these two different methods, we've managed to piece together this incredible story um, of the evolution of our universe, where physical matter came from. It goes right back 13.8 uh, billion years uh, into the past. And we can now go back, actually we think, to about a trillionth of a second after the universe began. That's, that's an incredible achievement, and that's the sort of story that I'm telling in this book. I should probably explain, first of all, though, um, why it's called How to Make an Apple Pie from Scratch, um, which, in hindsight, maybe I thought was a very clever title, but may have led to some confusion on, in bookstores and on the bookshelves. But it basically comes from, from this man. This is Carl Sagan, the, the chap in the, in the red turtleneck sweater. Um, and he was, uh, if you, you, may, you probably know who Carl Sagan was, but he was sort of one of the first big uh, TV science personalities, I guess. In the 1980s, he had this uh, television series called Cosmos, um, which uh, sort of took people on a tour of the universe from Carl Sagan's sort of personal perspective. And in one of the episodes, at the very beginning, there's a slightly strange scene where he's sitting in Trinity College, Cambridge, at a big dining table at the top of the, this uh, sort of oak-beamed hall, and an apple pie is brought out to him. And he looks at the camera, and I'm going to do my American accent now, so apologies. He says, <laughs> you know, by my Carl Sagan impression, at least, he says, uh, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Um, and this is quite a well-known quote in physics. And it's basically what Sagan is saying, that even a very mundane object like an apple pie, if you really want to understand where it comes from, it's not enough just to kind of go back to the supermarket and buy some flour and eggs and apples. You've got to go right back to the birth of the universe. And that's sort of the, the device that this book is framed around. Um, so in the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try and tell you the entire history of the universe, which is maybe a bit ambitious. So I'll, I'll give you a sort of potted history of what we've figured out, and I'll focus more on two of the big mysteries that we have yet to solve. So spoiler alert, I guess, we don't yet know how to make apple pie from scratch. There are some fundamental bits of this recipe that we're still missing. But we've got a lot of the story uh, together already. So um, to begin with, actually, the, the, the way I actually start, started working on this book was I did this rather stupid chemistry experiment where I went to the shops and bought a Mr. Kipling brownie apple pie. Um, other apple pies are available. And um, got my, so my dad, when he was a kid, was a very keen amateur chemist, and he used to sort of entertain himself as a teenager uh, in the 1960s, making smells and explosions at the bottom of his dad's garden. Uh, and including, you know, so his, his father actually was in the Royal Artillery, um, but even he was rather startled by my dad's experiments. And at one point, kind of, it was sort of had to rush to the bottom of the garden, shouting, stop that, that one rattled the windows. Um, Anyway, my dad still has a lot of his old chemistry equipment, so I went down to my parents' house uh, in South East London, and we basically thermally decomposed an apple pie. So we shoved some apple pie in a test tube, heated it to a very high temperature, and when you do that, what happens is the apple pie will break down into, eventually, uh, the different chemical elements that it's made out of. In particular, you get this charred lump of uh, charcoal, which is effectively carbon. So that's the sort of way that you know, people understood the world around us about 120 years ago, we'll say, at the end of the 19th century. If you ask someone, what's the world made of? Well, they say there's about 90 different chemical elements, and we have this periodic table, and, and that's sort of our understanding of matter. Um, and the idea was that there was an atom. So you have an atom, uh, different atoms, these indestructible building blocks, one for every of these 90 or so chemical elements. But then at the end of the 19th century, a number of experiments performed in university laboratories, particularly in the UK actually, start to challenge this picture. And it's eventually realized that atoms are actually not fundamental objects. They're made of smaller things. Um, they're made of particles, fundamental particles, or at least some of them are fundamental. We later discovered some of them aren't fundamental. Um, but this classic picture of the atom that you all learn in school, where you have a nucleus in the middle, the bit that contains most of the atom's mass, and then an electron, this negatively charged particle that goes around the outside. And so you actually end up with this really economical description of nature um, by the sort of 1930s, where there are only three things needed to make any object you like in the universe. And this is what I find, this, this sort of thing is what I and a lot of my colleagues find really compelling about physics, that you can kind of you know, uh, condense all the complexity we see in the world around us down to a very small number of fairly simple objects. 
Um, and it's also a great subject if you're quite lazy and not very good at remembering things. You have to remember three things. 90 is a bit much, really. So you have these three fundamental, well, three particles, the electron, the proton, and the neutron, and by joining them together in different quantities, you can make all the different chemical elements in the periodic table. Um, and this leads people to start to ask the question, well, okay, if, we can, if atoms are made of smaller things, does that imply that in the past they were somehow made? Did they, were, they, were they indeed assembled from these smaller particles? Because up until this point, if you'd ask someone, you know, where did atoms come from? Well, I mean, what Newton would have told you, Isaac Newton said, atoms were made in the beginning by God, and that's it. You know? So um, but now we can actually start to think, well, where did these things come from? Well, the problem with making an atom is if you want to make anything more complicated than hydrogen, which is just one proton and one electron, you've got to force two protons together to make a nucleus of a heavier element. But protons are positively charged. If you try and push two positive charges together, they push back very hard. They don't like to be next to each other. So to get them to join together, you have to get them going really, really quickly. So there was this big debate in the 1920s. Is there anywhere in the universe where protons move fast enough to overcome this electrical repulsion and join together? And it was realized that there, indeed there are. And this is where, so we, we, this is where sort of moving on from particle physics now to astronomy. And it's realized that stars, um, themselves, in their cores, generate enormous temperatures. So in the center of our sun, it's around about 15 million degrees. And at those temperatures, protons move fast enough that they fuse together. You can make helium, so you can make the next heaviest element. So we end up with these cosmic cookers, effectively, which are the stars that start with basic hydrogen and then gradually, over, over many millions or billions of years, build the other chemical elements and this process of nuclear fusion going on in their cores. And that's also, these reactions is where starlight comes from. Um, and then what happens at the end of a star's life is it explodes, or it, where depending on the size of the star, our sun will go and become a red giant, and then eventually it will waft its outer layers into space. And this is actually a picture of uh, something that was sort of the end state, effectively, of our own sun. This is the Bowtie Nebula, which is the, the remnant of a sun-like star. And what you can see in the middle, uh, well, you probably can't really see it, but somewhere in the middle of this image there is a little point of light, which is a white dwarf. Now, this is the, basically the core of the star that's been left behind, very, very small, um, only about the size of the Earth. And then surrounding it, you can see the atmosphere of the star that's been blown off into space. And if you study um, the, the light that comes from these objects, you actually can detect traces of different chemical elements that were made during that star's lifetime. And um, when I was working on the book, I had the really great fortune of going to uh, this amazing observatory. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Let's see. Loading. Here we go. So this is, um, this is the Sloan Telescope. So this is on top of a mountain in New Mexico, about 3,000 meters up in, the, up in the air. And what the Sloan Telescope does, it's a, it's, a spectro it's a spectrograph. So what that means is it looks at light from objects in the night sky, and it breaks the light into a rainbow spectrum. And by looking at these, you get these dark lines that appear in the spectrum of starlight, which tells you effectively what chemical elements are present in those stars' atmospheres. And this telescope allows us to figure out, for example, things like that nebulae have produced large quantities of carbon and oxygen, which are some of the basic ingredients of, of life, and also apple pies, as it happens. Um, I have to say, going to this place was really, you can kind of see, it was a really spectacular environment, watching the sun go down over the New Mexican desert and then spending the night on the mountaintop. I ended up with some real career envy, because as a particle physicist, you're generally in some dingy office somewhere underground. When I was um, a PhD student, my office was directly underneath the men's first floor toilets, uh, which used to frequently leak. Um, <laughs> the feeling of water dripping onto my head out of nowhere still gives me kind of uh, a bit of a start. Um, so... We can actually, basically by using stars, we can understand a lot of where uh, the elements in the apple pie come from. And this actually takes us a long way back um, through the history of the universe. The first stars, we think, blinked into light about 500 million years after the Big Bang. But if we go back further and further, eventually you get to a point where the universe today is expanding. So we know in the past it was smaller. And if you go back far enough in time, eventually the universe gets so small and so hot that the whole universe is essentially like the sun. And you can ask the question, well, what happened in the very earliest moments? Where, how, where did the atoms, the, the hydrogen particularly, that went into these stars that made the chemical elements, where did that come from? And this is when we start to run into some of the, big, uh, the biggest mysteries in science. So I'll, I'll just bring out, there's a lot of these in the book, but I'll mention one, of, one or two of them. So one of the things we also discovered during the 20th century is that for all the particles that we know about, say electrons and protons, there is a corresponding sort of mirror image which has exactly the same properties, but an opposite charge. So there is the, the electron, this blue thing, this is the, electron, the ordinary electron is negatively charged, but there's something called an anti-electron, 
which is identical but positively charged. The same goes for the proton. There's a positively charged proton and a negatively charged antiproton. And in every experiment we've ever done on Earth, if you, for example, in a collider where you smash particles together, you create, say, an electron, you will also create the anti-electron. So they're always made together. And if you bring them back together, they will annihilate each other and turn into radiation, into light, usually. So this, this begs a bit of a question, because if you go right back to about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, at this point, the universe was so hot and dense that there was enough energy to continually be creating particles and antiparticles. But because of this symmetry between them, you sort of expect equal numbers of particles and antiparticles to be made. And what happens is, basically, so in the early universe, you've got this sort of boiling soup, basically, of particles and antiparticles. As the universe expands and cools down, what should have happened, we think, is that all the particles and antiparticles should have met up with each other and annihilated. And what you end up with is a universe with, with nothing in it, um, apart from a few uh, photons whizzing through the infinite blackness. This isn't working. Oh, there we go. Hang on. It's a great tradition of my slides not working at Sunday Assemblies, if anyone's seen one of my talks before. But the fact is, we, we, we don't live in an empty universe, clearly. We live in a universe that's full of stuff. So the fact of our existence tells us there is something we do not understand about the processes that took place in those very earliest uh, fractions of a second after the universe came into being. Um, so this is why we do experiments, for example, at the Large Hadron Colliders. This is the machine that I work on. It's a 27 kilometer circumference particle accelerator. It's the biggest scientific instrument that's ever been built. Uh, by some measures, it's the biggest machine that's ever been built. And ultimately what it does is, it's really the sort of simplest, most brutal kind of science you can imagine, which is we want to know what the world is made of, so we take bits of it, we accelerate them round to a very high speed, um, just a whisker below the speed of light, and then we smash them into each other and we see what happens. Um, and, and one way of looking at what this machine is doing is that um, it's actually recreating the conditions that existed in those first fractions of a second after the Big Bang. So when you collide these particles, you create these incredibly high temperatures and densities, and hopefully you recreate the processes that might have allowed matter to be created, for example, at the beginning of the universe. So you have these collisions, and they're recorded by these giant detectors. Um, this is a, one of the experiments that's um, called the Compact Muon Solenoid Experiment. I always think it's a bit of a strange use of the word compact. This thing is 15 metres high, 25 metres long, weighs 14,000 tonnes. Um, it's got enough iron in it to make two Eiffel Towers. If you want to get a sense of scale, this is a, a person standing next to it. So it's a vast machine. It's basically a giant 3D camera that takes images 40 million times a second of these collisions and tries to see something new happening in those collisions. Um, and this is sort of an example of one of these mini Big Bangs, effectively, that we're, we're creating. And people like me, my job is basically analysing the data that comes out of these machines, try to see if we can see some new process that might explain what happened in the very earliest moments of the universe. Um, and actually, there have been some hints recently. It's been quite exciting. We've had 10 years of the LHC, more or less. In fact, 10 years ago, in about a month's time, was the discovery of the Higgs boson, which you may have heard of. Um, and so, but since that, that big discovery, which is a big breakthrough, we haven't actually found any of the things we were looking for. But recently, just in the last few years, we've been getting some intriguing hints uh, from the data that there might be something new, some, possibly some new force of nature. Now, we don't know what role this might have played. It's way too early to say, or even if it, if it really exists. But this could be a clue that will help us understand what happened in the very earliest moments of the universe. Now, so I was sort of talking there about what happened about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, but we can actually go a little bit, we can go even further back than that if we, well, we can try to at least. So here's a little diagram of the history of the universe, the apple pies over here, and back here is the moment of the Big Bang. So we can now, as I said, we can tell this story of the evolution of the universe going right back to just a tiny moment after uh, the universe came into existence. And the very, we believe from, from cosmology, or cosmologists tell us that the very, very, very first moment of the universe began with this incredibly rapid period of expansion known as inflation. So this was where space itself expanded exponentially, um, over, uh, in, incredibly quickly. And but to give you a sense of the rate of this expansion, um, it, a full stop at the end of a sentence, if it were to expand by the same rate as the universe expanded during inflation, it would end up 100 times bigger than the Milky Way galaxy. So it's, it's a huge blowing up, basically, of the size of space. Um, and we can ask the question, you know, what, what we really want to know is, this is what our sort of theories tell us, what we really want to know is, did this inflation process happen? The problem is, it's very hard to see anything as long ago as 13.8 billion years ago. And the basic reason is, if you look far enough away in space, you're looking back in time. And eventually, 
you get to a point where the whole universe was filled with this fireball and you can't see through it. So you're basically, it's like looking at the surface of a the sun. There's this firewall that surrounds us in all directions, which basically sets a limit on how far we can look with telescopes. And that fireball ended about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So that's, that's quite a long time ago, but it's not, you know, right, it's not right back to the very first moment. But interestingly, just in the last few years, there's been, a, there's been a major scientific breakthrough that may one day allow us to peer right back to the very beginnings. So this is, you know, if you want to make the apple pie from scratch, you need to get right to this, this moment. Um, and this is a, an instrument known as LIGO. This is a photograph of it. Uh, this, is a, this is a gravitational wave observatory. So it's a telescope, but it doesn't look at the universe in light. It looks at the universe in something called gravitational waves, which are ripples in space itself. So ripples in space time. Now, if that doesn't make any sense, don't worry. It's, it's quite a strange idea. But the basic, the, the thing about these gravitational waves is they can travel through the fireball. So they would have been there in the early universe. And we believe this inflation process, this incredible expansion, would have created these incredibly violent gravitational waves that would still be ringing through the universe today. So we're optimistic um, that with this new way of looking at the universe, we may one day be able to peer right, right back to the very beginning and understand the ultimate recipe of for where everything came from. Um, so I hope that was, uh, that's, that's going to give you a very brief resume of the story. There's a lot more than that in the book and it kind of goes into a lot more detail, the historical characters and the experiments and how we figured all this stuff out. But hopefully that gives you a flavour of, of what it's about and the kind of questions we're, we're grappling with in science at the moment. But, uh, so thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Um, we've, we've got some stuff we can put out at the end. Uh, so I'm just going to open this up. We've probably got about two or three minutes for questions. If anybody's got any questions for Harry. Although I can't see anything because of the light. Oh, Crudgy. What was the things you were alluding to? The, um, the, the hints from the Hagman Clark? Oh, so we've, um, so I work on an experiment that studies a particular type of particle called a beauty quark. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it's one of these fundamental ingredients. And we have this theory that describes how we think particle physics works. Uh, and these particles are basically misbehaving. So they are, that these, are, these particles are created in the collisions. They live for about one and a half trillionths of a second. They decay, then they decay into other things. And our theory tells us how they ought to decay. So what they should decay into and how often. And they seem to be not decaying into the right things and in the right amount of, you know, the right, the right frequencies, essentially. So it, what we're basically seeing are these indirect hints. It's where you basically measure a number and you compare it to the theoretical prediction and they don't agree with each other. Now, there's several possible explanations. One could be that we've made a mistake in our experiment. The other could be there's something new that isn't contained in our current understanding of the universe. So the most popular explanation is there's a new force that's basically sticking these beauty quarks together in a particular way and preventing them from decaying according to our current theory. So it's a kind of indirect clue. The idea would be in the longer term that if we get these clues firm up, that will then tell us what experiment to build next, where we might be able to go out and actually directly create the particles that are associated with this new force, for example. So it's early days, but it's um, yeah, potentially quite exciting. Andrew, do you think this is the only universe? Oh. Oh. Well, it's a tricky one, that, because if you look at the history of science, every time we've learned something about, what, every time we've had a major breakthrough in understanding of the cosmos, we've realised that our place in it is less and less important. So we used to think the Earth was the centre of everything and we'd got a place that's in the middle of the universe and then along come Copernicus and Galileo and people and show that, you know, actually, no, the Sun is the centre of the solar system, we're one planet among many. And then we realised that actually every star is its own, you know, solar system with its own set of planets. And then, you know, in the 1920s, we discovered that even the Milky Way, which used to be thought of as the whole universe, actually is only one of many you know, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe. So it's this process of realising that we're less and less and less special. Um, I don't know how you take that, whether that's reassuring or not. But, um, but it's, you know, thinking, well, are we the only universe? Well, that's a completely sort of philosophically justified thing to ask, therefore. But the problem is that, you know, there's no way, the, the, by definition, the universe is what we can observe. So by construction, if there are other universes, unless we're very lucky, there's basically no way of knowing whether they exist or not. Now, we do have some indirect hints, which are basically around these things, this, this thing called the anthropic principle. So we notice in physics that there are certain numbers in our theories that if you change them a bit, the universe becomes uninhabitable. It looks like, it's almost like you can think of like the universe having settings that have all been set to just the right settings to allow us to exist, which is a bit fishy. 
Um, so we would like to, you know, you could say, well, God made it, set it up that way so we can be here. Um, what we would really like is some theory that tells us why those numbers must have those values. And that's one of the things we've been trying to understand as well at the LHC. But the other explanation is there's a multiverse. There are many universes where all these numbers are set to lots of different settings. And we, we live in the one where we can. We, we can only live in the places where we can live by definition. So that, the, the, that's a sort of bit of an indirect clue that maybe it's out there. So I, I guess I'm an agnostic on the multiverse because we can't really test it scientifically, unfortunately. Um, I sort of skipped over this a bit. Well, I don't actually need to talk about it at all because I'm running out of time. But um, what, what so far it's seen is um, gravitational waves created by the collisions between black holes. So this is like a little, little cartoon of two black So you have two black holes. So black holes are basically dead stars, very massive dead stars that collapse. When, they collapse, when their cores collapse, they get so dense that the gravitational field around them is so strong that nothing, not even light, can get out. So they're these kind of you know, one-way trip if you go into a black hole. So there are lots of black holes out there in space and occasionally two of them will get into orbit around one another and they'll spiral together and as they spiral they create these ripples in space time. So this is what you're seeing here, the kind of gravitation. So that's what we call a gravitational wave. So LIGO, just when it switched on in September 2015, it picked up a signal from the collision between two black holes. So that's what it's seen so far and that, it's made quite, now it's seen several of these collisions. Um, and it's quite interesting because it's been challenged. <laughs>